There we are. Hello, everybody. So good to see you. It is now Thursday, March 28th. Oh, my gosh. Another month passing us by. So I think that our thir our Sunday show will actually be the 1st of May, something like that. Whoa. So good to see you. Good to see you. I've been busy working on that quilt, but I'm still a little confused what to do with it. So I'm not done yet, but I've been getting an idea of what um, what I want to do about the pet um, quilt that we're going to do next. Hello, Dolores. I got something from you today. I got something from Kathy Klein today and Miss Jeannie. So I'm going to go ahead and start a project I was thinking about working on because I've had such a good response. Thank you. We have the best ladies in the world. And I want to tell you something. As I'm working on this quilt, I'm getting the best string pile. And it's so pretty. And I'm thinking of getting a jar and putting all these in a jar and just setting them on a shelf. Because they're so colorful and pretty. There's just something delicate about them. So... It's so good to see all of you. Let's see exactly who's here. Oops, I meant to turn that off. There, okay. Um, let's see. Marsha, first person here. So nice to see Marsha. Hi, Miss Jody. Jody was the second person here. She was on the ball. And uh, Barbara Smith, hi, sweetheart. Cheryl, and Cheryl, I got something from you. And. Uh, this is so, so nice. Dolores, oh, so good to see you. Debbie, hi, sweetheart. Annette Parsons, oh, this is wonderful. So, it's been a beautiful, oh, I left it upstairs. I had the most gorgeous purple iris to show you. But maybe I'll pick a whole bouquet of things that are blooming in the yard to show you for Sunday. But, oh, spring comes along and just loves you up with color. And how lucky are we to have that? So I have been working on this. I was thinking, what else did I have here? I got a sweet card from Miss Jeannie. That was awfully nice. There have been some sweet ladies put a little, little something here and there in the quilt for me. But as I was saying, I know that our main project is supposed to be to have this done so we can move on to our pet portraits. And um, and we're going to do the wonderful pet portraits like, like Jody's artwork, like uh, Betty Middleton's beautiful swan, all of that. So work on it. Find a picture of your pet or favorite animal and what we're going to do is Miss Jody said you can go to the Word program and posterize it. I guess you would do, um, Jody might, if Jody fills up to telling us, maybe she could say, if you get on Word, what do you go to to do that fun trick? And I'm going to be doing mine through Adobe Photoshop. But I'm still learning my way. So it's not such a bad thing that I'm still working on this, but I have got one, two, three, four, five, six of the curved blocks, one unusual block, another in my head, but I forgot to bring red lame downstairs. I'm either going to do red or purple lame, and that'll be really striking, and it's going to be a small planet, but, um, oh, that's a, hey, that's a wonderful idea. Let me tell you, we had, um, we did a koi um, quilt, art quilt, not too long ago. And boy, did that turn out great. I've got another strip ready for the last piece to be sewn. That'll be my next block and probably my last curved piece block. I just don't know how big I want this to get 
And so it's like, ooh, better, better cut it off at some point. I also cut half rectangles because the block is finishing up at 12 and a half. Well, finished size 12, but 12 and a half, okay? And so what I did is I cut out some um, half blocks. So you would say 12 and a half divided by half, but then you've got to add your seam allowance. But what I want to do is I don't want to have them block, 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 block. Space doesn't line up like that. So what I want to do is, is to have, be able to put them off center. And as long as I use 12 and a half inches or six and a half inches, I should be fine then to work out the spacing. So I will in a minute show you my last strata strip and I'm still loving it, still loving it. And uh, I just love the movement that this quilt is going to have. And this is going to be a fun quilt to quilt on. What would be fun is to use some of my um, I have glow-in-the-dark thread. If I can still find it, I have glow-in-the-dark thread. And that would be fun because then maybe it would kind of do a nice light glow once the lights go off. But this would also be a good, a good quilt to use one of those little LED light sets that you can barely have poked through the front of the quilt. And so there's, you know, the sky is the limit. I could also quilt it with metallic threads. I can do, oh, different, you know, Milky Way type things on it while I quilt. So does a Care Bear qualify? Yes, a Care Bear qualifies. Whatever makes you happy. So yes, yes, yes. And hi, Judy Smith, Barbara Smith. Oh, we got the Smiths taken care of. So I thought I would show you what I've been working on for, um, it's so funny. I have so many irons in the fire right now. I have to be careful because I was so, I mean, I've got so many things I'm trying to think. Deadlines, deadlines, self-imposed, I know. But last night, I had a terrible time trying to sleep. I kept waking up. I had a headache. I said, okay, Charlene Piper is here. Let's do deep breathing exercises. Let's go sit out in the sunshine and read a book. Although, I went out on the front porch the other day. The wind was really blowing, and it looked like it was going to rain. So, Grammy, who is very much a scaredy pup, I took him on the front porch to see, oh, it's just fun rain. Well, the pollen was blowing so badly, I gave myself an asthma attack. I had to come rushing right back in, and I coughed and coughed and sneezed and coughed and coughed. So the pollen here, has it been bad for y'all? It's awful here. So I'll have to take some pictures. Could we just have that yellowy green coating on everything? But... So I've been staying in a lot, and what I've been doing is trying to balance between learning everything about my indigo dyeing and starting to prepare the fabric, because the indigo, I'm not even going to go near making the indigo dye bath until all my fabric is folded and prepped just right. In fact, today I scoured my newly bought PFD because after watching and reading, I thought, you know, I think it's just a good idea to go ahead and prep it because it's not going to hurt anything. And in case there's anything at all on the fabric, I want to give myself the best chance possible to get some really good indigo colors out of this quilt. So I'm very, very excited about it. And uh, you, you're retired. <laughs> you so, you're so sweet, Debbie. Thank you. And in fact, I do want, I'm hoping to get to see you at some point. So uh, what I, I've been sewing, trying to, I caught all the way up to 
because I started two weeks late for the Alex Anderson neutral blooms. I've caught up and now I am working. What? Hmm. Let me see. I thought, oh, I did bring down another bag. I forgot all about this. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. And here is something I was going to tell you about. Now, where is my sewing project? Hmm. Well, I thought I brought it down, but I'm not seeing it. So I was going to show you part of what I have sewn. I have the, the center sash strip um, that has the four patches and the half square triangles and the triangles. So, but anyway, I think I must have, I was trying to grab too much. But then, if you are a member of our group, you saw something that I put on the site. And I'll show you that. All right. Let me bring the camera down, everybody. <laughs> Maybe that can sound. Oh! <laughs> That's cute. Aw. There's another Smith, huh? So I think I showed y'all. Boy, I had a little package of stuff ready to bring down, and I must have left it. Darn it. But on our site, I had a paper where the, the all of the, um, I, I took a piece of paper. I made, where are they? Underneath here. I made little cardboard templates. Well, I can't get, here they are. Here are some of the cardboard templates. So I made cardboard templates, and then I traced them on a piece of printer paper. Yes, got the card. Thank you, Miss Jeannie. And, uh, and oh, that block, it, don't tell Jody, but that block is gorgeous. So I made, I made these, and um, then I took a piece of, what do you call it, printer paper, and I filled the paper up based on, I knew the most I had to have was E, so I put more of those, like 12 of those on each page. Then, Mark, we got my printer paper, and he helped me cut the printer paper into printer size sheets, and it worked. We printed on, I mean, the freezer paper. We printed on the freezer paper, then I took and cut them out. Now, I had a seam allowance built in. We cut them out. I ironed them on the fabric. I love that freezer paper does this. Then I had to come back and cut away the seam allowance paper. Because in using, and, oh, now you know what? Do I not even have that? I must have left some things up. I was going to show you. Yeah, I didn't bring everything down. I was going to show you my Appliquick tools that Miss Nadine gave me and that I use for this. So this is how I knew I had to cut away the, the seam allowance. Normally I do needle turn, but I thought I want to get a crisp, nice edge on my applique petals and centers. So I've started using the Appliquick, Appliquick glue and the holders so that I can fold nice, good shapes. I'm thinking I'm still going to put these on by hand because I just loved appliquing by hand. And um, so I've got both the different petals. So now I have, this is like 260 lots of work, 260 templates I had to cut out. And then once I put the freezer paper on the fabric. Then I had to go back and cut away the freezer paper um, seam allowance so this can easily be folded and glued on the freezer paper. My plan is, I've never done this technique before, but my plan is to glue them like I did here, put them on the fabric, to take my careful stitch, applique stitches around the edge. And then right before I get to the final part of the edge, 
to take a pen and pop out the paper and then do that last bit of sewing by hand. So I just wanted to show you, I do this in the evening when Mark and I are watching TV. This has been a lot of work, a lot, lot, lot of work. But anyway, I do have all of my components made for the center sashing strips. And that is the four patches and the half square triangles and the triangles. So I do have that everything, all the components made. And let me tell you that, whoops, hello. Let me tell you that I finally figured out, for the most part, finally figured out how you take the center intersection and twirl it so that it's not a thick lump. And I'm not perfect at it, but all the years I've been quilting, I know for the last 10 years I've been hearing to do that. I didn't know how to do it. I could not figure it out. Now, I figured it out very easily on four patches, but on some of the other stuff. So right now, I've got to switch my focus, put, a, put down the... Um, Put down the neutral blooms until I get my um, indigo stuff prepared because I've got, I'm writing a handout for all of you. I am learning how to, I, I really feel like so, so far as doing the actual dye bath, I've got it down pat and I my sources are like the Victoria and Albert Museum in England. Hello. <laughs> A wonderful museum down in South Carolina. And Wikipedia. I mean, I, instead of, I found as I started watching the YouTube videos, the knowledge and technique varies you know what I mean so I said if I'm going to teach this I'm going to teach it the right way so that's what I'm making sure to do but I have to tell you some people are really sticklers to do indigo dyeing naturally or they'll use something like a fruct mm, a fructose or fructose reducer and that's to take the oxygen out of the water it doesn't give as pretty a color of dye. So I am glad. There are times, just use the chemicals. Use them carefully. But sodium hydrosulfite isn't this, you know, isn't a big, bad, horrible thing. It's just very effective. So, um, in fact, it comes in the RIT packages. RIT color remover is sodium hydrosulfite. So just be careful. But like I said, I took all of my yards of fabric. That's PFD. I've already scoured it. It's now in the dryer. And I'm drying it just shy of fully done. That way when I press it, oh, you get the nice crisp press. Do not put starch or anything else on. Speaking of starch, when Mark went to the big grocery store this weekend that he only goes to once every month or two. He bought me two new cans of starch. This is my new best friend. I've got to tell you, since I'm a careless quilter, I know how to do it. It's just making myself slow down and do it carefully is painful. But this really helps me improve my quilting. So, and it's just inexpensive, inexpensive can spray starch. I have some liquid starch that I can mix up into a solution and put it in a spray bottle. That's just one more thing on a plate that's low overflowing with too many things to do. So one of these days I'll get to it. Now, let's see. Are the Smiths Scottish? Hmm. And, you know, Smith came from, like, a smithy, it's a term for a person who does something, like, um, would do, oh, gosh, um, like making horseshoes, ironwork, 
it's really neat that when you listen, like my last name is Johnson, that is son of John. So, you know, all these names I love, you know, tracing. Where did these names come from? What did they do? So one of the things that I did earlier just to show y'all today was I have been learning how to do resist. You've all heard of shibori. Shibori is the Japanese art of resist dying. We all, what fabric are you using for Alex Anderson Embroidery Project? I'm using my own stash, but it's a quilting cotton neutrals. And, oh, the embroidery. No, the embroidery pro project, <laughs> the silk dupioni was too expensive for me. So I went to Fabric Warehouse and online and got the polyester dupioni for one fourth the price. That's a deb deal. <laughs> so, but I, and, and you know what? It looks great. And I'm going to put it in a frame. And so I, I, you know, I guess if you know, if you are um, a connoisseur of your dupionis, you would know that it's not silk. But I was not going to spend $20 a yard for silk. That is too expensive for me. So anyway, um, but thanks for asking. And then um, I took today and heated up my soy wax. Let me do this a different way. I think if I backlight it, you'll see what I've done. I got my chanting out, which um, I can show you what that is. It is the little receptacle pen that you see the hole, the hot wax goes in there and then you draw whatever you want to create a wax um, resist. And I was using soy wax, but you know what? I think I might switch over to a good paraffin. Soy wax is really lovely, easy to melt, not as smoky, not as, you know, won't catch fire if you're not careful. I have a little electric skillet. Let me show you that, too. I have this. It's made for doing melting wax for candle making. And it's a little electric skillet. And here is my soy wax. But I think I might scrape that out and use some paraffin because one of the problems, sometimes when I want to get a clean design on this, it's hard with for me and soy because I don't make small enough lines. Okay, let me see. I'm going to hold it up to the light behind, and you should be able to. I took soda bottle lids and just did a whole bunch of soda bottle lid shapes. And then I did different drawings. I did some flowers. Um, just, I tried, to, this is mostly just an experiment to see. And this, I did the flat part of the soda lid. So it's a, a, a wider. And yeah, it'll just kind of give me an idea of what things work and what things I need to practice more. So I did that today, and then the problem also with the soy wax is it was really building up on the fabric. So I took one of my hard rulers and scraped the excess off and put it right back into the dye pot, I mean the wax pot. But when I go upstairs tonight, I'm going to take some more of this fabric. Yeah, some of this wax is still falling off. So... Um, but I'm going to go upstairs tonight and try, oh, I thought I brought it over. Um, I'm going to try the good old clear gel glue, clear gel school glue, because supposedly this works really good as a resist. Earlier when I was doing some dye work, it didn't do as well, but maybe I didn't let it dry long enough so i'm going to do a little bit of that that kind of resist dying hello mary and um and then i've got to do 
all of the folding. And I'll give you a little preview of that. But while I'm trying to do all this, I'm also trying to learn Adobe Photoshop because I owe you guys a video um, I made of the covering of the ironing board. And right now it's still sitting on Photoshop and I'm trying to figure out how do I do that? So let me show you a couple little things. I don't think I have my rubber bands in here. Let me grab. You can tell I've got a lot going on because I've got stuff everywhere. Okay. I can give you, especially since I don't know what I'm going to do with my, um, my circle pouch. I don't know exactly how I'm going to set up my planets quilt with the Kirby lines. So let's talk about this. So if you indigo dye a yellow fabric, will it turn green? I think it will. I was watching some people do indigo over yarn. And one of them had a, a, a yellow yarn and it turned a greenish blue. So now... I can give you some instant facts to show I've really been studying this, but indigo is not soluble in water. Okay. And most water is the number one solvent we have here on earth. And, but it doesn't work for indigo. So that's where you have to add soda ash and then it won't stick to fabric to the fiber unless it's not, it's in an unoxygenated, deoxygenated state. So once you see, um, once you see indigo and it's blue, it won't. It might make your fabric look blue, and it, but it'll wash all off. So it was really interesting. One of the dyers, she was great. She was like a science teacher. She talked about indigo when you put the um, when you put the reducing agent, which I'm going to use, um, sodium hydrosulfite, sodium hydrosulfite, it plumps it up so it gets trapped in between the fibers. And she said, if you, because they use indigo on blue jeans, and you know how blue jeans get wear places where you rub them or where your hands go or where your wallet is, that is because. Indigo doesn't bond with the fabric as much as it gets trapped in the fibers. Okay, so that's where it's different from like a Procyon dye. And that's part of the beauty of blue jeans is, you know, nobody wants to walk around with perfectly dark indigo jeans. They want to have the little marks and the, you know. <laughs> I love that, Barbara. That is so cute. Barbara said her husband says that everybody's last name was Smith until they messed up. So then <laughs> that's so cute. But, um, oh, gosh, it was so funny. My maiden name was L-U-E. Lou. Well, being Debbie Lou was not fun. So I couldn't wait to get married and have a new last name. Boy, that shows how old I am. And the first week I was married, someone said, Johnson, how do you spell that? I thought I would wring their neck. Oh, and did I tell y'all the other day, did I ever tell y'all, I think I did tell you the punchline of telling the gal who said, oh, we share the same birthday. And I said, well, that's also Harry Truman's birthday. I don't know who he is, she said. I instantly felt very old <laughs> so anyway okay so let me show you a couple things but boy where you get into the intricacies of um indigo dyeing is all the different ways you can make patterns on the fabric and that's really cool you know, if you just put a, 
a plain piece of fabric that's not bound in some way, it'll just be a blue. And blue is beautiful, my favorite color. But depending on how you fold it and how you secure it, if you put pins or clips on it, rubber bands, all of that, then you've got, yes, you have to have a sense of humor. So, you know, then the indigo becomes, it's kind of like a living, breathing thing that you can manipulate. And, and I tell you, I am already becoming a fan of indigo. I, I've done a couple of times I've done Procyon dyeing, and that's more like a science class. But indigo is more like learning about a friend and learning how to cooperate with the friend. Okay? So, I have, um, so, you know, when you make your dye bath, you're going to use warm water because that'll help and you've got to get it soluble. Then you use soda ash, which will turn it so alkaline that then it can be soluble. Then you add your sodium hydrosulfite to take all the oxygen out of the water. And when you do that, it turns a yellowy green, a weird yellowy green. And then you know you've got it made. And what you'll notice is they call it a flower on the water on the top because all of the oxygen that kind of bubbles up and gets trapped in bubbles, you can actually scoop off if you want, but put it back on later because evidently it's protective on it. But that's also why you always keep it covered. You do things like your fabric has to be wet before it goes in and you want it to be all the way wet because the dye needs that wet fabric so it can move on the fabric. And, but you, what you have to do is make sure it's still not dripping. Squeeze it out before you put it in. Gently lower it in so you're not making any bubbles. You don't want to swoosh it in because that incorporates oxygen. So squeeze out the fabric enough that any air in the fabric, in any excess water, part of water, H2O, oxygen. Then when you go to get the fabric out, you, you take a gloved hand and you're swishing it gently under the surface. You're not going splash, splash. You're underneath going, ooh, gentle. Then while you're underneath the water, squeeze it out. Okay? Then when you come out of the bucket, come run it up the side and out of the bucket. Some people think, oh, I want to squeeze the excess dye out into the bucket. The moment you do that, you are going to be putting, the droplets will push oxygen right down into the water. So don't do that. So you just kind of squeeze it under the water, keep your hand tight on it, bring it up the side and out. Some people have been rinsing theirs right away. But the pe most people that I trust, I think I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be setting it into an empty bucket, letting it oxygenate. Also, to get a, a deeper color, when you're using Procyon dyes, to get a deep color, you leave it in the bucket for a while. Then you put it in another container and leave it closed up in a warm place for 24 hours. That's how you get your deeper colors. That's not the way the indigo works. Indigo sticks to the fabric by the process of oxygenation, the oxygen hitting it. So what you have to end up doing is you have to let it um, oxygenate, which can take 20 minutes. And then when it's nice and blue, then you dip it back in. So we're going to do a test piece of fabric that we dip all the way in. And that's the first dip. Then the second dip, you only dip it two-thirds of the way in. Then you let it oxygenate. Then you dip it again one-third of the way in. And that will show you the gradient to show you this cotton that you're working on. Your dye bath today, this is what each color will look like when it's been dipped once twice or three times. 
And so then you let it, you don't take, you don't take your rubber bands and all your cute things out of it until you're sure it's the color you want. The color will look darker when you're dipping it because it's wet. But understand it will dry a good bit lighter. Most people say they like three dips. So I'm not going to be able to enjoy the creations I make for a couple of hours because you dip it, you let it sit in, in, in the indigo for a couple of minutes, you take it out, you let it oxygenate for a half an hour, then you put it back in, dip it. So you can see it's going to take a while before I get the, the wonderful, you know, clothesline of gorgeous sky blue fabrics. So it'll be fun. And I've got all this stuff written down. So that if you end up, you want to try, this is what I would tell you to do. Buy a Jacquard Indigo Dye Kit. It has gloves. It has some things that you can use in the resist method. It has all the chemicals you need. It'll make a five-gallon bucket of dye, and it will dye 15 yards of fabric. Okay? Do that. My way was a lot more expensive. But I think I'm going to like this. I think I'm going to be doing this for a while. And you can maintain your dye bucket. If you're very careful with it and you, you close the lid. At, if you're not putting something in or taking it out, have that lid closed. Keep the oxygen out best you can. And you can maintain this. If you keep it at a room temperature, you can keep it for a few weeks. And they have different ways that I'll also put in the handout. Uh, okay, will it need a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that and how you handle that? So it's really, really exciting. I, I know when I worked at the museum, we heard that women always kept a dye bucket in their kitchen. And I think that I learned that urine was a really good mordant for some of the dyes. So... And that would make sense. It has nitrogen in it. So thank goodness we're just doing indigo. And just so you'll know, they're all different kinds of plants that have indigo in them, but they are different strength. Like if you've ever heard of an herb called woad, W-O-A-D, it also was used as an indigo dye, but it doesn't have as much of the indicin, which is what that color is called. So it's a magical process, how they figured out. I mean, you wait until I even put some shortcuts of the best videos that show how you take indigo from a plant in the garden or on the farm and turn it into a magical dye. And so uh, that way you can see, because it's fascinating. I'm going to bring you down here really quickly. And what I want to do is show you a couple little things about the fabric. And then right before we go, I'll put this last strip on that. But let me show you. So I, oh my gosh, there is this one woman, um, beautiful Asian woman who t just shows you the most complicated ways of dealing with um that of folding and doing the resist dye, the shibori. And I'm going to be doing some on the pole and everything. So, like, there's one way right here I'll, I'll do very quickly. And I would use a smaller, whoops, well, yeah, be careful with that camera. <laughs> I would use a smaller piece of the white cotton fabric. But what you do is you take a 10-inch glue stick or something else about this diameter, maybe a little bit thicker paintbrush, something like that, dowel rod. And you roll up the fabric on a diagonal like this. Then you can take rubber bands or you can take a heavy thread and you twist it around tightly. Then you scrunch it down like this. And then it will, okay, let me, it's hard to scrunch it when you don't have the, 
if you had to rubber bands and ties all along the edge, it would hold it for you while you scrunch it down. But you scrunch it down and it gives you this. And that gives you the most wonderful striations of blue and white. In fact, it'll give you, look at this, see what how it just got wrinkled? That's what it will do with the dye. Okay? So, now, the other thing that you might want to try, and all of this will be on my video, because I'm going to video all the different ways of, I'm going to cover everything, from doing, figuring out the resist, everything. So, you can take glass marble, and put it underneath the fabric like this. Now, where the marble is, that'll be the blue color. But what you do is you take a rubber band and you twist, 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 twist around like this. And what you'll end up getting from this is blue in the center, then a white ring. So you'll have white cir open circles all over. And so you just put a bunch of these. I was watching ECAT, and which is a type of weaving that they use colored threads. And they were taking some of the fabric, some of the ladies, and doing a tiny little pinch like this, and then taking fine um, thread and twisting around it, making little tiny dots all over the fabric. I won't be doing that. I don't have that much patience. But what you can do is, however many circles you end up wanting on this fabric, that's how many marbles. Now, let's say you use a marble shape like this. Then you won't get a circle where you put your rubber band. Let me show you. And I have different size rubber bands, so I'll use smaller ones. The tighter... The tighter you put your rubber band on, the more white, pure white the circle is. If you put it on loosely, then it's going to kind of be a real pale blue circle. Okay? But that keeps the dye from getting in that part. So that's the shape you'll have. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Then um, you can use smaller marbles. So whatever you have then I'm going to get some pieces of thick cardboard and, um, okay, let me go down this end and show you. Thick cardboard or pieces of ceramic tile, anything or a piece of wood. And what you do, anytime you fold fabric for indigo dyeing, you do it accordion style. Okay, accordion. Now, that's really, really important. If you did it this way, you're never going to get any color in there. Okay? So, instead of that, you do accordion. So, I folded it this way. Then the next fold is like this. Then the next fold would be like this. Then, let's say you want to make it a little square shape. Yeah, yeah, it does create texture. It creates whatever you do on the top, it telescopes all the way through. So, although the top will get a lot bluer in the, in the inside. But let's say you want to make it into a square. So, you're going to do the same accordion fold on the outside. And let's say you want to have a blue rim, but pretend that this is either a... Um, piece of wood or a piece of plexiglass or a piece of thick cardboard and then when you take and put this on here and then you put your rubber bands around it like this okay and normally it would be a nice neat little package so you decide how many rubber bands you want to wrap this up with the number of rubber bands will give lines Everywhere the rubber band touches, it will stay white. So you can, you know, do different techniques. Like you could put this on the corner and make little white um, squares. Because the part of this that touches the fabric will leave a white fabric behind. So there are all 
so many different ways of doing it. And then there's something easy like, okay, let's go back to where before we wrap this all up. And let's say we have a piece like this. We've done the accordion folding. And I would do the folding even smaller. So let's see. Let's drop this down so we can get as many designs off that piece of fabric as we can. And I've already ironed this fabric. But if it's not really well ironed, do it while you, every time you fold it. Then you take and you can put rubber bands and make sure to make them tight okay it won't leave a nice white line but you could just tie it like this all the way down or if you take this accordion fold and you could take and pinch it like this and put a rubber band on it and that will create a different kind of design so it's really amazing. I saw one where they did this hand sewing. They sewed a great big thread across the accordions. Like every time there was a fold, they would do big stitches all the way across here. And then they would pull it tightly and gather it all up. And, and since they did the big sti even stitches, it gathered up like this. But after the dye, they called it teeth. It looked like a row of teeth. I'm not going to be doing that one. I don't want teeth. <laughs> but, you know, main thing is to remember when you do indigo dyeing is do the accordion fold. Always do an accordion fold. And then you can do things like put your clothespins here and on the other side and you can do alternating or whatever everywhere the clothespin touches will leave some white so i just thought i would that's just a very brief description i have all kinds of things that i want to try and that i will do and that's what takes the, the most time so I'm going to probably try to work on this 12 hours between now and Saturday. And because you really have to have all of this done before you get the dye pot ready. Once you mix in the dyes, like if you were to get the Jacquard um, dye kit, leave at least an hour for the all of the oxygen to come out of the water if you try to dye it before it is fully deoxygenated you've just wasted your money when you go to rinse the fabric all the blue will just roll right out so remember it has to be a yellow green and then when you what the magic of it is you take it out and you watch it right in front of your eyes turn beautiful blue so i'll film all of it for you all right so right whoops now that wasn't nice now i've made you all nauseous i didn't mean that okay so now i'm just going to show you this is the last time that i'll be doing one of these um because I'm hoping to have this quilt done next time. Next time, we'll definitely want to start on our pet portraits. And I'm going to get together with Jody. And um, I, won't be, I won't be there for the Jitsi, but there will still be a Jitsi going on, okay? And um, so, if you want here, this one is already cut. So, this time... For this last row, I'm going to line this up here and go ahead and follow that cut. And then this piece and this piece will be sewn together. Okay? And this is my last strip that I'm making that I know of right now. <laughs> oh, and I wanted to tell y'all, these screws right here, I was telling you about, I noticed that it started, it would start to cut and then stop. 
And it was because the screw had a groove in it worn by the blade because I used them so much. So Mark contacted, contacted the Martelli company and they sent out two new screws. Unfortunately, this is a left-hand cutter. I need a left-hand threaded screw. They sent one of this kind and one of the right-hand kind by accident. He called them up and told them, you know, the one fit really good, but the, I can't use the other one because it's threaded for the right hand. Do you know they immediately sent him out two more? So I've got to tell you, you know, these I consider relatively expensive, but they are built like a Mack truck, that we used to say. And when you can get the new screws, they're pretty much indestructible. So I wanted to give a shout out to Martelli. And then I want to give another shout out to CDW Quilt, I mean, um, Computer Parts and Software. They did a really good job for me in helping me to get set up for my Adobe, my new Adobe software. And I feel like Frank Samansky went out of his way. I wanted to give him, you know, when you get good service, you've got to tell people. Let me pull this a little bit closer. All right, here we go. So now I'm just, since this already has a lovely curve, I thought, why reinvent the wheel? Just come along and cut the underneath fabric to match that curve. And, and you see I hold the fabric behind the cutter. You never put your hand in front of the cutter. And let's say that it starts to want to bunch up. Then put your hand on both. And you don't have to cut right up against the other fabric as long as you follow it about an eighth of an inch away. But if you were to accidentally cut the other fabric too, it would just give you a new curve line for both of them. So see how I take this piece that goes in my string pile. Then look, now this fits perfectly. So now I'm going to pick this up and show you how to sew it. Then I'm going to show you how to cut it. And then... We're done with it this week. Now, since this probably won't go for any more strips, I'm going to cut this even with the main link right, main with the other, with the rest of the strata. So let me pick this up, take it. I always do this to know these sides together. Boom, there we go. I do not pin. I don't feel like you need to. It has been so easy. Oh, I did find that I did start pinning on the Alex Anderson Neutral Blues when, oh, you see my, my hot glue gun burn. That was a bad one. Be careful, people. Hot glue guns are not for children, and I am one. So, but um, when I started lining up my four patches to four patches. I had to start pinning. All right, here we go. Got this even. And you notice I kind of try to go straight the first inch and in sewing this because it makes it easier to start your stitches. I stitch it. I've turned my stitch length down to 2.0. It's entirely up to you if you want. But yeah, Martelli stands behind all of their products. And that's, that is wonderful. Good American company that stands behind everything, which is lovely. Okay. So let me make sure I keep my hand out of the way. And this is, I do not pin. I saw someone pin for their curves. But to me, that would make it harder to get it smooth. Because all I do is I, this, I pull this way. And this, I pull this way. And so it's just side by side. Staying on your seam allowance. Don't worry so much about getting the edges even that you forget your seam allowance. I had to go back earlier today and 
some of my seam allowances were way off, so I had to go back and do it. Oh, I wanted to tell you, too. So while I made my first strip on the neutral blooms, so I had the sections, I had a four patch sewn to a half square triangle and a half square triangle sewed, sewn to a four patch, and then those were sewed together. Twirl the seams, press them out good. Then you have to take the triangles and put on the sides because you set those blocks on point. I had to re-sew three times in just a four-section block. I couldn't believe it. I have been quilting for so long, but it's like your eyes have a hard time saying, what side of that triangle goes on the outside? <laughs> so I just thought I would tell you three times it took me in about two foot of sewing. I had to redo it. But I'll show you that Sunday. So I'm just kind of coming along, holding it very gently. In fact, you notice, I'm, I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm not like grabbing it. I'm just kind of moving it. And so, and that's part of the beauty of this is you're just guiding it, just gently guiding it. And it allows the fabric to relax and give. Because that's what you're doing. You're asking the fabric to relax in certain areas so that you can then um, just gently guide it along. So here we go now, and I've got them. And this is where it gets, it looks tricky, but you just keep the edges together and keep them on your seam allowance. And see how I start moving this in now? Sometimes if it doesn't move in enough, just get up get up there closer and move it back in. If you feel like you're going to get a pucker, just give it a little tug. The opposite way of the pucker will remove a pucker. So here I go, just gently. And you can see I am not holding on to the fabrics. So I'm just moving them back and forth. If you did try to grab and control the fabric, that's when you're going to see a lot of puckers. You're forcing it. But I'm just being very gentle and saying, asking it please and thank you. <laughs> please do make this curve for me. And you know what? It does. And then if it's stubborn, then I get the last say when I iron it. Because I will iron it in, into submission. <laughs> So here we go, the last little part. And once again, it comes together beautifully right there at the end. Okay, so there is the last one sewn that you will see on this project from me. And I'm sure you're like, thank goodness. And now, now I'm going to show you how I press it. And then how I cut it. Because I'm not sure if I've cut these for you yet. Alright. So here is the new piece I have put on. Every time I put the piece on. I make the seam go that way. I don't worry about light or dark. Every seam goes away from the other one. Okay. Because some of these I got so close together. If the seams were to go towards each other. Then you would have. You know, all those pieces of fabric coming into play at one little point. And see what I'm doing right now? And I'm just kind of letting the fabric know the iron is coming. And it's going to expect it to bend in a certain way. So I'm kind of giving it advance notice, just like you do with toddlers. And then when I come at the, at the fabric with the iron, it knows what to expect. Okay. Making sure that there aren't any puckers. And I love my woolly mats. Boy, I use, I have this size and then an 8x8 eight eight upstairs. But this is just wonderful. 
today I almost I started to iron on the cutting mat and luckily the iron had cooled off it had done the auto shut off and as soon as that iron I felt it touch the mat I pulled it back up real quick and grabbed my woolly mat but for a moment I thought oh no so there is the last strata for this quilt all right so now somebody let me know if you're still there because I haven't seen any comments and I don't know whether you're paying attention or whether I've lost the feet. So I always worry about stuff like that. Okay, I've got a piece of Taylor's chalk. I've got my template. And this template cuts the space fabric backgrounds. Okay. And then that's for my edges of my curve. Oh, good. Yay. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Here is my, this is my convex curve. And so what I learned when I was doing my curve pieces is I would prefer to be like this and have the, the block fabric sort of almost lined up, but not quite. Can you see that? So that I had to learn how then to cut because I only, if I'm lucky, I get four cuts per strip, okay? And I need four cuts. So what I'm going to do is, and you notice my strips vary in width, but it's usually one, two, three, four, five, six. This one had a little, was a little bit bigger. But what I'm going to do is I don't want them to line up perfectly. I love the wonkiness of it being a little erratic, but for the top half, this piece must go in the same up and down configuration. So let me show you. I'll start out here, bumping this all the way over, deciding where do I want this thing to fall. I think I'm going to have it stop at the orange, take my Taylor's chalk, and mark it like this. Whoops, hold on. This is Clover Taylor's chalk. I love it. Okay, so now you can see this piece. So let's say this is going to be the top part of the planet. So then what I need to do is I to have the other side. It would be like if I flipped it this way. So what I'm going to do is come over here. And now, one thing I can do is I to save fabric, I see how I kind of line it up this way. So this is going to be the bottom one. So this, it, I've turned it upside down. See, this piece was like this. Now I've turned it upside down and over. And look how that fits in. So good. So now I'm going to, and this just helps me save strata space. So I'm going to put, and the good thing about this is when I make my opposite piece for right here, I know they won't line up perfectly because this changes all the time. So if this piece was like this, to do the other half of the top of that, what did Charlene? Oh, is the baby? Oh, is the baby here? Oh, she is there in labor. The great grandson will be here soon. Yay! Oh, I can't wait. So now the next piece to match that is going to have to go this way. So now what I'll do. Okay, I think today I did one more different thing, and I'm going to try that. For the bottom part of the planet. I'm going to take this and I'm not, I'm purposely not lining them up, but I'm going to go ahead and draw this next. This just saves on fabric. I've done it enough with this being my seventh planet. I know how to save fabric now. So I line it up, but it's not lined perfectly across because I want to make sure 
that when I sew them together in the middle, that the swirls do not line up. Because that's just too easy. I want to have that. All right, so now, here are the bottom two. Here's one of the top. Now, I knew I had this, so I wanted to flip it for the other side. Guess what? Now look where that goes. And it leaves me with a little extra fabric to do something special, okay? So now what I want to do is see how much of the top fabric and how much of the orange. So I'm going to move it up a little bit so that it's reasonably close to this one, but not perfect. Does that make, I'm hoping I'm making sense. But by cutting it this way, now I've got a three inch piece of leftover that I can use for something special in the quilt. And I, you know, who knows where I'm going to use it. So now that I've marked it, then I will come in here and I will cut the straight lines. Okay. And I'll come over here. And cut this straight line. Okay. And here is the extra fabric I get to keep. Then I'll cut this straight line down on the bottom of this. And then I'll come over and cut this straight line down here. I just kind of do it a little bit at a time to make sure I've got it right. Now, if I'm feeling bold and my hand's not going to shake, I can go ahead and just follow the chalk line, keeping my hand behind the blade, because I don't want to go to the emergency room tonight. All right, now I've got one of those cut out. Now I'm going to come over here and cut on this curved line, carefully keeping this hand out of the way. When I can get behind it safely, then I can put my hand back here just to kind of hold the fabric taut while I cut. And if you're going to make a mistake cutting a curve, make it outside the line. If you find yourself going off, just go out, outside the line because you can always come back and trim it again. So here I go. And now you know why I end up with all these little cute strips. All right. So now, here, this is going to be from this direction. This is going to be from that direction. Two more cuts. And we are all done for tonight. So a straight cut right here. And then the straight cuts on the bottom. And I like doing all these straight cuts before I do the curve because I think that way I don't have to worry about making a, a bad mistake. You know, I've, I've gotten everything except the curve. All right. These off. All right. So now just the last two curves. So. This one starts right here. I start cutting, put my fingers back behind it, and just follow that curve around. Done. This one. Okay. It runs right up to the top here. So I start that curve, put my fingers behind it. There I go. And... Yeah. All right. And I keep all those strips. So now look at what I have. These are the concave pieces that will get sewn on like that. Now I've got to find the one that matches this. That is this one. Ooh, that's a little close, but it's not too perfect. So thank goodness, because I don't want them to match perfect, perfect. Now, if you want to match them perfectly, you know what I would do? I would cut one half, turn the template, cut the other half without cutting down the center. If you wanted them perfect, that's what I would do. So now this is going to go here. 
Let me pull these up so you can see the whole thing. Okay. All right. Now, then this one goes down here. This one comes right here. And then you put, so these together, and I do not even pin those. They, it, this method works so good. And for this size, they're pretty easy to do. So there, I, I've got yet another planet. Now, if you want to be silly while you're doing it, then you could take and turn the blocks. So, whoops, I guess I would, how would, how would I do this? Hold on, I think I have to put, yeah, put this this way. Let me see, let's put this down here. Whoops, nope, let me see. There was a way that I turned them all which way before, but now I've kind of forgotten how that is. Oh, well, but what I, I must have cut them differently because I had them going all different kinds of ways. So, but if you want them more random, you could do that. Uh, anyway, but now you kind of get a chance to see. And that's the last one, but I am going to get, I am going to get some of my LeMay's purple, red, I'm not sure all what, and make a couple small planets to go like one in front of one of these. And I don't know why I turned off that light. I'm sitting in the dark. Okay. So I hope I covered everything that, I wanted to tell you, and I'm going to be very busy until I see you on Sunday, but cross your fingers that I will have at least the ironing board, um, the ironing board video already up, and maybe debut the Indigo video Sunday, so that's what I'm hoping. All right, any questions that you have before we go? Oh, thank you. And Marcia, thank you so much for being our hostess and our moderator. It means a lot to us. I, it, it has been a fun project. And you know what? You could, instead of doing something for outer space, you could do hot air balloons with this method. You could do um, birthday balloons, bubbles, bubbles under the water. So, you know, if you don't want to just do a space theme, think of what circular object you could use. You could make lollipops. Oh, my gosh, and put a stick down below each one. So, there's so... The machine for sale, it is upstairs. Kit, are you going to be here Sunday? Oh, it's okay, Kim, sweetie. A walk was a good thing. And you can you can get ready and watch this back right away. Um, Sunday, I will have it here with all of its components to show you. Um, we took it upstairs, and I'm using Goo Gone to get off any little silly stickers I put on there. Mark thoroughly cleaned it, checked it, and uh, so we'll, we'll have it here. You will be busy. Okay, then um, I could probably make you, you know what I should do is probably just make a little quick video of it. But it's the one you've always seen me sew on in, except for the last week, two weeks. But I will, I will get you some information on it, hon. I sure will. All right, and it's a long one. It has a nice, it would be an excellent candidate if you wanted to learn how to do quilting on a domestic. And like I said before, it has automatic needle threader. You just touch the pedal. It has an auto knee lift arm. Um, it has it has the auto threader, needle threader. I'm trying to think what else. It was a really nice one. The reason I got another one is I wanted a hover, the foot to hover. 
because I do so much art quilting and thread painting. But otherwise, it's it's a winner. It's it's a it's the seventy two hundred quilters dream. So okay, I will see you all on Sunday, and uh, have a great. Friday and Saturday. I hope the weather will be beautiful where you are. So get out and get some sunshine. Saturday morning, I'm going to go buy my plants for the season. Then I'm going to come home and hopefully if it doesn't rain, I'm doing my indigo dyeing. So it's going to be a busy weekend for me. And next Monday, I won't get out of bed at all. <laughs> all right, everybody. Take good care of yourself. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Saturday morning will be a jitsi. Oh, that's, you know what? Uh, Annette and I could jitsi with the machine. Didn't even think of that. So, Annette, I do believe you belong to the group. So, I'll, I'll stay in touch with you. All right, everybody. Take good, good care. Jitsi, Saturday morning at 11 Eastern time. And we have some people that are usually always there. So if I can't make it, which I don't think I can, they will be there. So let yourself in and say hi. If you need a invitation to the Jitsi, send me an email at our time to got to click on the play. Sorry. Oops. Hold on. Our time to quilt. Okay. Our time to quilt at TWC. Whoops. It would help to have my glasses on. C.com. Vanity is my name. So anyway, all right. If you need an invitation for the Jitsi, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to send it to you. Send me your pictures for Show and Tell Sunday because we love them. So send me pictures of your work, your flowers, your yard, anything that you're happy with. All right, everybody. Take good care. Oh, thank you, Miss Mary. I can't wait. I was a master gardener. And in my old days, I love gardening as much as I love quilting now. Oh, baby. I'll have to tell you about it Sunday. Take good care. I'll try to find some of the pictures of my dozens of flats that I had started seeds. I have started hostas. I've started crepe myrtles from seed. Yep. Yep. I'm a nut. All right. Take care, everybody. Oh, thank you. If you would hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Friday. Bye-bye. Nice seeing you. Bye.